Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our next session, which will take us actually directly to the future in the sense that we have now an end date and that is 2030. Not to say that the world will end in 2030, but we'll intellectually travel to there or rather look at the road that will take us to 2030. I'm very pleased to have with me four distinguished panelists that will look at this, these trends in four different ways, or maybe even more than four. Um, we'll start first with uh, Elisa Goldberg to my right. She's the Assistant Deputy Minister for Strategic Policy, Department of Global Affairs, and she came to us from Canada. So thank you for making this rather long journey to be with us today. Um, the reason I'd like to start off uh, with you today is that uh, we heard from Professor Dresner earlier that actually Americans feel more optimistic about the UN than many of us in Europe thought. So maybe multilateralism isn't actually on its way out, one of the things that we're terribly concerned with in Europe. Um, I know that you focus and you work on multilateralism and global governance. So what is your take on, well, the state of multilateralism between now and 2030? Hmm. Thanks very much uh, for, for having me and your question makes me think about Monty Python uh, and the Holy Grail. Um, <laughs> multilateralism and plurilateralism is not dead yet, uh, so don't worry, uh, there's, lot, uh, there's lots that's going to continue uh, between now and, uh, and 2030 with respect to multilateralism <coughs> and plurilateralism. That is still the way that the system functions, that's not going to dissipate in the last 15 years, but as was suggested by one of the previous panelists, we're not necessarily at the high point of 2030. 15, uh, where we saw uh, the Paris Agreement, we saw the SDGs, we saw the Istanbul arrangements. There was a whole series of international conferences that were addressing uh, a number of international stresses. Um, nor are we what I would argue was a high watermark back in 1999 and 2000 when we had a whole series of agreements. We also had a Security Council that at that point was highly functioning. Um, but we will nevertheless continue to see uh, global governance in action. Now, but particularly on those things things that demand urgency, and that tends to be where institutions function best, right? It's crisis management. So in response to catastrophic natural disasters, in response to uh, terrorist events, you'll see the system be able to come together and rise to it. Uh, you'll also see um, new partnerships being established within the system. You know, I, I think of when Gavi uh, was created. That's the kind of institutions that we're going to see going forward. It's those public-private partnerships. But we also have to be mindful that the system uh, as it is right now is under stress. And maybe there's five stresses that I would, I would point to which pick up on some of the things that were flagged this morning. The first is this shift towards uh, protectionist, isolationist, uh, ethno-nationalist domestic policies in a number of countries. Um, notably, but not exclusively, in those countries that were the very countries that supported the institutional development of global governance over the last 70 years. So that's sort of tr problem trend for global governance, number one. Number two uh, is the kind of growing unilateralism uh, amongst major major old powers and even the new emerging powers. So the new emerging powers aren't exactly coming to the table with brand spanking new ideas. In fact, they want to take up the same unilateralist places that some of the older powers wanted to do, which, by the way, for countries like mine, not great. Not, we're not enthusiastic about that, and, and I'll come back to that later. Um, so we're seeing that, but that's being combined with authoritarian regimes and some other states that are seeking to weaken agreed international norms, standards, and agreements, and particularly those that are inconvenient for them domestically. So global international human rights instruments, um, environmental standards, rule of law, good governance uh, kinds of issues. Third, I would say that there's uh, a reduced confidence amongst citizens in international institutions, uh, particularly those <coughs> that have uh, those parts of our citizenry that have been disproportionately uh, impacted by economic inequality. This is something Professor Dresner spoke to. Um, mismanagement and corruption. There's a, a group of uh, folks within our societies that are extremely disappointed with how global institutions have managed that. Um, also those uh, who are facing environmental degradation or those who just aren't seeing the kinds of remedies from international institutions that they expected, including on human rights questions. Um, friends and I like to refer to this as global 
global is social warming, right? If on the climate side we've got global warming, uh, our citizens are experiencing a social warming and we need to be paying attention to that. Um, the fourth trend that I would uh, point to is related to a crisis of legitimacy about the representativeness of some of these global institutions. Um, and then profound concern about the performance of others. Uh, if we think about the Security Council, for instance, <coughs> how much time it took it uh, to come to grips with Syria, for instance. There were other international institutions, by contrast, though, that were acting. And the much maligned Human Rights Council is actually an example of an institution that did rise to the challenge and established a commission of inquiry. But still, that's a, a fourth trend. And maybe the fifth and final one that I would um, point to in terms of some of the strains on multilateralism and global governance is this proliferation of malevolent um, non-state actors who are using a variety of methods and means um, in order to undermine citizen confidence, um, both in international institutions but also in their domestic institutions at the same time. So, what does all of that mean? I, I would say, simplistically put, uh, we're seeing right now widespread short-termism and fragmentation, uh, which is a concern for those of us that look at our international institutions to address long-term problems. Um, increased intolerance, um, intensified disruption by spoilers, uh, and an attrition uh, away from what had previously been agreed to as kind of liberal approaches to addressing shared uh, global problems. Now here I'd point to um, some of the things that, again, Professor Jesner pointed out, which is this isn't necessarily new. Um, so just to say that the antecedents for some of this anxiety around global governance um, has been building for some time. Uh, and there's different things we could point to. We could say, well, the 2003 uh, Iraq war was certainly a touchstone. Uh, Russia's uh, intervention in Georgia in 2008 is another, this tendency towards exceptionalism and unilateralism has impacted on the system and the confidence uh, in global governance. But I would say, different from 10 or 15 years ago, this is now reaching an inflection point. And so for all of us that care about global governance and these international institutions and systems, it's now urgent uh, that we shift towards more innovative approaches, new partnerships, new kinds of tools, and investing in making sure that new actors can come into the system. And so that means things like creating spaces for cities uh, to come to the table when we're talking about some of the pressing global challenges. It means thinking differently about the role of um, the private sector and some of the conversations that we're having, but making sure that as we're doing it, it's always with in mind having what is going to ultimately ensure that our citizens are going to be getting services for them or outcomes that are much better than had we done things in the old traditional ways that we have in the past. So for me, those are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about right now. Now, from a Canadian perspective, as I mentioned, a system that kind of goes back to Westphalia doesn't really work for us. Uh, and so we're investing heavily in making sure that we think about what does this innovation in the system look like. And so I hope we get into that more uh, in the discussion. I'm happy to talk about some of the things that we're doing, but it explains, for instance, why we're investing in trying to bring together people to talk about what does a revitalized WTO look like, for instance, because we believe uh, in a rules-based international system for trade. It's why we're investing in the International Court of Justice and some of the other institutions because they matter. There are certain fundamental foundations where we need these global systems to curb the excesses of those who would like to assert themselves uh, to the detriment of our citizens and to many, many more citizens globally. Thank you. I really like that you have a very constructive and, and, and positive approach to this because I think the feeling that many people have in this town is helplessness when it comes to actors, for instance, like Russia, who, um, well, for instance, the foreign minister said last week in Rome, uh, there are those like the Europeans who want to replace international law with a rules-based order, which frankly confused me because I was under the impression that they're kind of the same. Um, but the question is, how do you deal, how do we deal with, with people who, or, or actors that <coughs> want to spoil the system rather than work with it? I mean, it's much easier, obviously, for us to work with a state like Canada, but how do we engage, how do we convince spoilers that this is still a system worth supporting? Yeah, I, I'm 
I feel like I'm pop culture today. It kind of reminds me, Tom Clancy <laughs> uh, has this character in The Hunt for Red October, right? Captain Mark Aramius. And he says at the end of the book, he says, you know, a, a little revolution now and then is not a bad thing. Um, <laughs> and for me, the, the big way that we deal with the, the spoilers um, is through issue-based alliances. Uh, it's all about working with unusual suspects uh, and making sure that those unusual suspects are engaging constructively in the system. So it means that you don't necessarily just work with your traditional quote-unquote like-minded, because um, like-minded is going to change depending on the issue, right? And so it's thinking about how do we pull together all of these different issue-based alliances to grapple with these fundamental core questions that we've been talking about all morning. And to me, that is one of our recipes for success. We'll come back to that uh, later on. Let me move on on the note of like-mindedness to uh, Jima, who is the executive director and co-founder of the Afrobarometer, and he came to us from Ghana, so it's an even longer travel. Or is it? I'm not sure, actually, than Canada. But <laughs> <or> travel, <laughs> travel aside, <laughs> a little shorter. Traveling aside, I know that you work um, uh, a lot, obviously a lot on, on polling and, and on democracy, and uh, many of you might not know that actually the continent where democracy has really risen since the 90s is Africa. So um, when we look ahead at 2030, what are trends that you see when it comes to political systems in Africa, what are challenges perhaps to democracy, also in the light of the demographics. Um, please give us a few of your thoughts. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, as a consumer of uh, media and some academic journals, at least the work political science and social science, academic writing, I've been hearing quite a bit about the decline uh, declining commitment to democracy around the world and in various regions of the world. But that is generally not the case for Africans. We have been uh, interviewing ordinary citizens in Africa um, by the last count, 275,000 interviews over the last 20, almost 20 years across all sorts of indicators, and what we generally find is that there is strong popular support and maybe even demand for democracy, democratic politics, and democratic institutions. But it's not only that, there is quite strong support, and this support is fairly widespread. Um, across the social and, uh, social and demogra demographic divide um, across Africa. What is a challenge is supply delivery of democracy and accountable governance lags and has been lagging behind aspirations. And I have some comments to make about that later. When you take one of our measures of um, the support for democracy, just to ask people uh, to choose between uh, democratic democracy versus one-man rule versus uh, one-party rule versus uh, military rule, we find strong rejection of the three non-democratic alternative forms of government uh, relative to strong support for democracy. We, we also, <coughs> thank you. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Does that, is that the one you want? Yes, well, let me see if I can. Okay. The other point I wanted to share with you is that when <coughs> this support is relatively, uh, the, then we, when you track the, the supply, you find that young people are a little bit more dis less, dis less satisfied than the older ones. Everybody or most of the population is dissatisfied, but there's a little bit more of that for the younger population of Africa than the others. And I'll have uh, some more comments to make about that in my general conclusions. Perhaps the only, there are few areas where 
we find that you know, citizens are, are less supportive of things that we will consider to be complementary to democracy, and that is protection of the media from government interference, government control. When we started asking this question earlier on, there was majority support, support got even stronger, but in the last three rounds of the survey, we see a drastic decline in popular support for media, for, for the media to be protected from government interference. And we think uh, there is a concern because at the same time as citizens say this, they also say that they want the media to scrutinize the government. There's something happening there we don't quite understand, but we think that it's instructive and it's something that we should pay attention to as policymakers. And we also, and it's not that we only ask people about the big D, uh, whether you support democracy or military rule or whatever. We try to probe whether, what are people's attitudes to presidential term limits? A very vexed question in Africa today. Okay. And on that, again, we find that even stronger majorities support presidential term limits, including countries that don't have presidential term limits in their own constitutions, you know, such as the uh, parliamentary uh, Westminster types of government. So it's a very strong norm, um, and again, support for this is widespread across the population. I think for us, a, an even stronger measure of popular desire for democracy and accountable governance Comes, in, uh, comes from the responses we get to a question we ask about whether people prefer to have an accountable government even if it is not so efficient versus one that is efficient but not accountable. Again, when we started asking that question, we were getting sort of uh, mixed responses, but increasingly more and more people are saying, a larger and larger percentage of the population are saying that they would rather have accountable governance than, even if it's not so efficient, than one that is efficient but unaccountable. That, to me, to us, speaks to a great, a very strong yearning for accountable governance, for democracy, and uh, related things. So that then raises the question of what does it mean when democracy supply, when accountable governance supply continues to lag? What does it mean when more and more of our respondents say they see corruption at the presidency or in the office of the presidency and they are unimpressed with the efforts that government makes to fight corruption? What does it mean when our respondents say they see impunity among public officials, uh, officials in general, and um, they are less and less impressed with the attempt to Deal, to deal with impunity in their countries. And what does it mean when this demand and this level of dissatisfaction is, str is strongest with the younger segments of the population than the older? So I think I'll leave this there and um, come back to you with some suggestion about, from our standpoint, what we think policymakers should be paying attention to uh, in Africa with respect to governance and democracy. Can I ask you a follow-up question because I found the, the, the statistic interesting on media. Um, I, I, maybe you are aware of the fact that I think there are similar voices also in, uh, in Europe in the light of fake news. So that's a, rea a backlash on, uh, on the, f the question of manipulation. So what spurred this dip also in, uh, exactly, thank you, uh, in, in support or, or actually the increase in support for go government interference? Is that also related to fake news? Or how do you explain this progressive decline for media freedom? As I said, you know, this data is yet to be really fully, we haven't fully interrogated it. We just find it interesting, that we find it intriguing. But one thing I can say from the data, what we've looked at so far, is that support for democracy is strongest among younger people, and especially those who, and people who live in the urban areas, those, with, uh, those who uh, are on social media a lot. 
internet and other social media outlets. So uh, maybe they are the ones who are picking on this uh, fake news uh, business because you know the, the rest of the African populations are not necessarily on the social media screen or on the in in on the internet yet. Mm -hmm. Well, we come back to the question of of African democracy in a second. Uh, let me turn to Kaspar Klinger, who is a tech diplomat. I have discovered. He will explain to us what that is in a second. Uh, uh, he comes to us from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Denmark, where he is a tech ambassador. Um, technology or modern technology, we've just heard it about social media. I mean, it's, it's not actually a mega trend, it's a meta trend in the sense that it permeates all the other trends. So can you tell us first a little bit about what a tech diplomat does or a tech ambassador does and how you see technological innovation over the next decade provide opportunities, but also the challenges that we might face? Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. I mean, just before we, we kicked off, uh, you asked me, did you come up with that term yourself? Are you a real <laughs> diplomat? And uh, just, to, just to confirm, uh, I'm, I'm not a software engineer, I'm not a coder, I'm a real normal, boring diplomat um, from the Danish Foreign Ministry, <laughs> hey, hey, so I didn't hey, invent not, the position we're myself. We're not boring. <laughs> we're not boring. <laughs> well, give me a few minutes and I'll correct you on that one. Um, <laughs> Listen, what we're trying to do, and to some extent my job is, is, a, is an indication of the transformation that we're looking into into the future. Uh, we're trying to treat the industry, the technology industry, in a way which is similar to how we treat our bilateral relations with, uh, with countries. Um, so we are disrupting at least the Danish foreign ministry from within. And where my job is different from some of the previous jobs that I've had is that my embassy uh, has a global mandate um, and also global presence. I spent most of my time in, in Silicon Valley. Um, and I realized that I've done the full power of diplomats. I've gone native, I'm not wearing a tie. <laughs> Excuse me for that, but that, that's not what you do in Silicon Valley. But part of my team is also in, uh, in Europe, in Copenhagen, in Beijing, and we're actually opening up uh, part of the office also in Nairobi and Kenya, not too distant in the future. And the reason why we're doing that is, of course, that when we look into the future, we think that uh, it matters a lot what Brussels is thinking, what, uh, what Washington is, is doing, uh, but it actually also matters a lot what the technology industry and what digitalization is going to do, both from a foreign policy point of view, but also from, from a local uh, point of view. Uh, we're used to thinking of geopolitics or balance of powers in terms of conventional weapons or nuclear weapons or even perhaps uh, economic powers. Uh, what we are arguing is that we need to look into accessibility of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, IoT, uh, critical infrastructure, because that's what's going to define the winners of losers, winners and losers of tomorrow. And it's certainly also going to define, uh, you know, where will, where will the majority of power sit uh, on a global basis. Um, I think it's important to say this is not a tech pessimistic initiative. We are, in fact, um, extremely optimistic. Also on a personal basis, I, I believe that technology is going to, going to do good for, for the world. It's going to lift people out of poverty, bring better health care, bring better education on a global level. But it is certainly also a realistic initiative where we are focusing also on the flip side of the coin, which is that it won't necessarily be everybody that will benefit from the fourth industrial revolution. We're going to see people locally, including in countries like Denmark, that will be having more difficulties getting access to, to the all the benefits that technology will bring about because of lack of skills and competences, because of lack of, of infrastructure, um, and perhaps also because of sort of a fragmentation of politics or, or, or the social uh, movement, as, as previous speakers said before. I think that's true on a local basis, but it's certainly also true on a global basis. And as a small open economy, um, somebody who, uh, a country that has always been keen on sort of uh, being responsible also on the global stage, we think we need to, to take a strategic view on that. And we need to work with the industry, but in fact also with other countries. So one of my KPIs is actually not to be the only tech ambassador when <laughs> we meet again next year and have this uh, discussion. <laughs> Let's see whether I'll fail on that one. I am Scandinavian, and although I live in, in Silicon Valley, it means that I'm sort of partly chronicle uh, depressed. Um, so I think I'll, I'll focus <laughs> on, on three concerns that I have looking into the future and living, um, living the technology dream in, in Palo Alto on a, on a daily basis. Um, I think what, what we're looking at short, ter short term from a, from a tech perspective is a deep concerns uh, on, on cyber security. Uh, we had our 9-11 moment uh, last year in Denmark when the Napetia attack hit us quite hard and especially one of our large uh, companies. I think that was a, a, sort of a game changer uh, 
a wake-up call in order for us to focus much more on, on our defenses, capa defenses capabilities. But I think short-term, what Russia and non-state actors are doing on the cyber security side is something we need to be uh, extremely preoccupied with. Uh, we haven't had a massive sort of catastrophic cyber security attack um, yet, and hopefully it won't happen, but that's something I, need, I think we, we all need to pay uh, quite a lot of attention to. Medium term, um, and this goes to the core of what I'm trying to do also with the tech industry, uh, both in, in Silicon Valley, but also in Huangzhou and Shenzhen, in Tel Aviv and in Europe as well. Um, that is to try and help, uh, what I would say, get the leadership right in the technology companies. Um, I cannot share all the conversations I've had with some of the big technology companies, but I can tell you it has not always been a smooth ride, and it's been um, as difficult as some of the more uh, complicated conversations I've had in my career with difficult regimes around the world. And I think we really need to hit the control alt delete button and get the mindset of some of the big, big technology companies in a direction where they take a societal responsibility, which is proportional to the kind of influence they exercise on us individually, but I would also argue, argue on, a, on a global level. Long term, um, I think it's the shift of power from, uh, from the West to the East. Um, I think it's the role of artificial intelligence and not least what is going to happen in China. Um, I think they have enormous uh, opportunities for sort of reaping the <coughs> benefits of the age of artificial intelligence because of no lack of access to, uh, to data. Uh, they don't have the obstacles of the general data protection regulation that we are uh, so proud of and happy of uh, here in Europe. Um, and, and that will, will sort of reinforce the, uh, the transformation we're, we're looking at. Just to wrap up, what's the deduction of all of that? Um, and I'll try and be a little bit positive despite my Danish heritage. Uh, I think there are, there are two things. Uh, the first thing is we need to, to reinvent the relationship between the private sector and the public sector. We need to bring them into the equation. We need to have them take a construct, constructive responsibility, also on the regulatory front. Um, and we might have to threaten them a little bit with the big stick of regulation, and, and Europe has a key role to play here. But actually, coming from a country that has always been light on regulation, but right on regulation, we would like to see the industry stepping up to the plate and, uh, and adhere to some of the values and the institutions and the governance structures that we built up over several centuries. The other thing, and I think that's the positive thing sitting here in, in Brussels, and just a disclaimer, I used to work for the institutions, so I'm not completely objective in this regard, but I think Europe has an incredibly important role to play. When I look uh, sort of globally on technology, I don't see anybody else stepping up to the plate to try and set a direction for the ecosystem of technology, defining some of the key values, some of the key regulatory frameworks that I think are, is going to be important. Um, I thought that in this job I would focus quite a lot on, on technologies and autonomous vehicles, but what I find I spend most of my time on is actually talking about values, about institutions, about protecting democracy, human rights, etc. And I think we need to bring those discussions into the headquarters of the big technology companies. The first uh, sort of battleground will be with the European and US uh, companies. Further down the road, I think we're looking at a much more difficult conversation with, uh, with Chinese companies. Uh, you mentioned European regulations being an obstacle, but they are often or, or mostly the result of Europeans being very distrustful of the gathering of data. I mean, my family in Germany doesn't even want to share their location when they're ordering pizza online, which makes it then difficult to get the pizza. But more generally... That's a price to pay. <laughs> that's a, how do we convince... Uh, firstly, obviously, how do we strike the balance between uh, big data that is necessary, but of, of course the necessary protection of our citizens, but how do we get the European public to be more well, less distrustful and see, see the benefits of this. Is that also part of your job to, to advocate for, for more sharing of data in that sense? Yeah, I, th I think you know what is what is different with with my current job compared to the previous job is I, s I work as much on the domestic side as I do on the foreign policy side. So this is also about changing the mindset of our decision makers, our politicians back home, and perhaps even the public. I, I think looking back 12 months uh, that I've been in this job, um, there, there are two observations. First, we've had some massive uh, scandals, uh, Cambridge Analytica. We've seen some data breaches lately, um, and I think what is what is important to say is that in Europe generally we have trust in governments which is very different compared to Palo Alto, where I'm living uh, right now, and probably elsewhere in, in the US, Europe, and, uh, and Asia. Uh, but it's very easy to jeopardize that trust when we see uh, sort of the big scandals rolling out. And I think the problem with Cambridge Analytica and some of the other uh, scandals is that that tilts the population's trust in new technologies and the innovation processes that we're looking at. So I think the trust uh, dimension is going to be uh, critically important. Um, 
is, is GDPR an obstacle to innovation? Um, I don't think it is. And in fact, I think what we're seeing is a momentum that uh, even in, in Sand Hill Road, sort of the epicenter of, um, of venture capital in, in, in Silicon Valley, uh, people don't get nauseous when they talk about governments anymore, and they don't get nauseous when they talk about regulation. So I think there is a momentum. We're seeing you know, places like California, uh, India being inspired by GDPR, and I think that has set a very clear direction. But I think we also have to be honest, we are not in complete agreement even within the European Union among the 28, 27 member states. There are different approaches to, to technology. You mentioned Germany. Uh, I think France has, France has a different opini opinion on it. I think what we need to formulate is a very clear vision, a political vision and a strategy on how we want to embrace technology in a way where we set certain limitations uh, through regulation, but we also, where we also avoid uh, stifling innovation. And I don't think we have that balance right yet. Mm. Thank you. Well, we'll come back to that, I hope, later on. Um, on the note of artificial intelligence, I will use that to liaise to our next speaker, Annette Idler. Uh, I, saw, I read an article that said that for the prediction of conflict, artificial intelligence is not there yet. So you're not yet out of your job, Annette. <laughs> okay. uh, Annette is the Director of Studies at the Changing Character of War Program at Oxford University. Uh, we had a chat earlier, I said, um, there are today more than 120 conflicts uh, going on. When we look at 2030, um, what do you think is the, the trend or what are the drivers that, that will shape the future of conflict? And you had an interesting response for me. Please, Annette, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, well, my immediate response was that it might actually be counterproductive to count the number of conflicts that we look at. And that is because we don't even agree on what is it that we should count and how should we count them. So the definition that we normally use is a conflict has to have at least 25 battle deaths. But what happens then, for example, to all the violence that is taking place in um, areas, in regions like El Salvador, like Honduras, where actually the homicide rates are higher than the combined homicide rates and conflict-related deaths um, in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. So this kind of links back to the discussion we had before about what is actually conflict and how do we understand this gray line between war and peace. So what I suggest is to look more at how can we change or how can we understand the changes that lead to insecurity. Because what we do know is that it's very likely um, that by 2030, more than half of the poor of the world are likely to live in violence-affected places in the world. So what is it that, that is changing right now? And why is it so hard to kind of get a, um, a better understanding on how many conflicts there might be or what this actually means? Well. First of all, we see a proliferation of violent non-set actors. We've talked about this um, already in the morning session, but basically what we see is that, and the ICRC has confirmed that, in the past six years, more new non-set armed groups have formed than in the past six decades together. So there's a huge increase in the number of non-set actors, violent non-set actors involved in those conflicts. Then the second trend that we see is how those conflict actors are operating transnationally. There's just this one example of ISIS, which at some point claimed that they have um, provinces in more than 10 different countries of the world. So just to see kind of the scope of that. And then the final one, which kind of links to what we've just heard from Kaspar, is the easy availability of technology for those actors, especially of information technology. That means that non-set actors can recruit via social media, they can use um, Twitter, Facebook, and it's this instant availability of information that allows them, for example, to use remote violence tactics and actually inflict a lot of suffering somewhere else um, in the world. So what shall we do? Well, I propose to look at kind of three challenges where I think we need to kind of reframe the way we think about. First one is to look at the variety of violent non state groups. Yes, we know the state is no longer the most important actor. There are other actors that are important as well. But actually also within violent non state actors, there's a huge variety. And especially the lines between who's a conflict actor and who's a criminal actor or a terrorist are increasingly blurred. So if we look at the interdependence of how those actors interact, rather than just the single categories, we can actually better understand how they then impact um, on local communities. The second point is the network character that basically is a product of those interrelations. What we see today is that these different groups work together. Organized criminals, subcontact, computing hackers. 
We know how terrorist groups, for example, have deals with arms traffickers or human smugglers. We also know how rebel groups are cooperating with drug cartels to increase territorial control. And as you can see on this map, and this is why I brought some slides, because I think it's quite useful to just visualize um, how they are connected, you see that actually the illicit flows that span across the globe, they correlate with hubs of instability. So we can't really look at one region without um, looking at another one. We know that the drug trade, for example, starts in South America, in the Andean region, but those flows link to West Africa um, and then go up until Europe. Same um, example exists with the Middle East, where you have a convergence of different flows, and these obviously fuel um, conflict and competition in those regions as well. So rather than looking at single categories, we have to change our minds and look at how the networks work. And it's often brokers, it's sometimes anonymous middlemen in the Western world that facilitate cashless transactions that actually link the different actors across the globe that make it so effective and that mean basically where we are lacking behind. And then finally, the third one is what I call shadow citizenship. And I've brought this picture from my field work um, that I did in the, in the Colombian conflict. So what you can see here <coughs> is how armed groups, this is rebel-held territory, how they um, impose speed limits, how they even ask for fines when people don't obey um, to that. So what is happening there? Well, there is some sort of social contract where armed groups are providing certain governance functions, and that includes some sort of order, that includes some sort of security, and in return, they're socially recognized by communities. And this is not an exception. Just think about the Taliban in Afghanistan, think about ISIS in parts of Syria and Iraq. So what we see is that in places where the central state is not present, we see a new form of citizenship, of shadow citizenship emerging, where the state is not actually seen as the best option. It's those armed non-state actors that are seen as the ones who are efficient, who are governance providers. And these are the places that we often neglect. So what it means then for the responses is that when we think about security and when we think about security in the future, we need to move beyond military and law enforcement <coughs> approaches and actually also complement this with good governance and with development. Thanks. Thank you, Annette. I think what's, what's interesting, uh, an interesting point that you made is that there is a very strong develop trend towards conflict being largely well driven or conducted by non-state actors, which is also the case in the region that I work on, the Middle East, North Africa. But then international law, when it comes to conflict settlement, is actually quite void. There's, there's, there's not as much regulation when it comes to intrastate conflict when it, as when it comes to interstate conflict. Do you have any original idea on how we could uh, fill that gap, perhaps? Well, I think it's actually going beyond that. It's not just interstate versus intrastate. It's also the transnational character um, of state. There have been new approaches. If we think about the situation in Syria, for example, there has been a huge discussion that started um, a few years ago on how to facilitate cross-border humanitarian interventions and how to think about um, those people who are affected across borders. So we need to basically rethink the legal framework, but we also need to think about who are the actors that are relevant. Because if we stick to this idea that we only address those who are challenging the state, rebel groups, insurgents, who are starting the, the, the revolution, if you want, then we miss an entire um, group of actors who claim to be criminals, who claim to be militias or gangs or local groups, but they are actually involved and fuel the war economy as well. Well, I hope we come back to that. We now have time for questions and comments from the floor. So uh, please raise your hand. And if not, I will take a cue from Anne Mettler and just point at you. Please. <laughs> the lady here in the second row. I am an historian and I have been 15 years member of the European Parliament, a fellow professor. I, be, I am agree with Mr. Godler and Mr. Yami Wadi, that something that we are forgetting when we speak about risks is that we need to give a strength to the, to the institutions. Without institutions, we have no democracy. And I believe that in this moment, we really democracy are only the elections that legitimate the politicians. But the Brexit, for instance, shows that one minister, because they want to want to win the elections, 
They can break a country. So we need, in Africa overall, it's not only capacity building, we need to strengthen the institutions to develop in our civilization the concept of sustainability of the institutions, because only with good institutions that can protect the citizens, we can go ahead. And I believe that in all Europe, we are not making uh, these decisions, that we need to limit the powers of the politicians. Some decisions cannot be taken before an impact assessment. What are the consequences of these decisions? And if I speak to another colleagues that I have in the parliament or in the politicians, they say, oh, we are not going. We cannot limit democracy. We need to limit what are the limits of democracy and limit the power in front of the citizens. How do you think, because I believe in, in, in this case of Africa and other things, we need to make a reflection about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. There was one here, over, over there on the left somewhere. Yes, and I also that there are also two questions over here. Hi, thank you. Maggie Grayson, designer futurist. Um, I'm wondering if the, in the name of what if or how might we, actually create a democracy within these social media platforms? Can we vote on who might the president of Facebook be or Twitter? <laughs> That's an original question, thank you. And I saw here, yes, this gentleman here in the third row, and then there was one just behind. And then we come back to the panel. Thank I think we have time much. for a second round, so please. Thank you very much. My name is Yanu Tutsoy, I'm from the council. Um, I like your intervention, Mr. Klinge. Um, that is a very structured and very clear-cut uh, presentation of the most important challenges. My question to you is about uh, the regulation you mentioned and uh, new shaping of relationship between state actors and private actors. How do you see the role of the soft law in that respect? Because regulation means better regulation, mainly legislative acts or non-legislative acts. Whereas here, as you personally underlined it, is much better and more practical uh, to look also other sort of uh, relationship and trust, uh, mutual trust building actions. Um, the second question, if I may, also very quickly to you, Madam Idler, I also like yours as, as a lawyer. You mentioned that we need to um, think about new legal framework concerning transnational, international hu humanitarian law actions. Um, here within the EU, the problem with international humanitarian law that is belong to member states. This is a member state's competence. So in that respect, what means, what practical solution you could see within the EU in order that there could be a better coordination between the member states in connection with a better implementation enforcement of international humanitarian law standards in the conflict zone, like you mentioned, for example, Syria, but there are many others in the world. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll take a last one from the gentleman. If you could pass on the microphone next to Paul, thank you. Uh, hello, I'm um, Paul Ivan, uh, Senior Policy Analyst at the European Policy Center, independent think tank here in town. Uh, question to Mr. Klinger. Now, you mentioned the risk of uh, yeah, cyber attacks. You mentioned one of the big attacks that took place last year. Um, what do you see as the best ways of getting actually the EU member states uh, together to react together to some of these uh, uh, attacks? Uh, because as far as we have seen, we have seen condemnations, but uh, Nothing, nothing much. So how, how you're also a diplomat, how to get everybody to, to think and to react as, uh, as, as one. Thank you. So I think one of, the, one of the key themes that I've heard, not only through uh, your four contributions, but also from the audience, was the theme of, of trust, of loss of trust, or actually increased trust in the system. Um, Jima, maybe I can start with you, because uh, one, the first question was also, asked to you about strengthening institutions in Africa, will that increase trust uh, or, or the limitations of polit power politicians? Uh, what, is your, what is your take on that? Well, my take is a bit indirect. Uh, it's indirect in the sense that our data clearly shows that you know, citizens are getting a lot more demanding of their government in terms of performance, uh, both 
performance on the political front, performance on the economic and social development front. That is, that is clear, and that you see this on the streets in Africa with urban riots all over, anti-corruption demonstrations in South Africa. Uh, if you think of the fact that the, in the Gambia, after 22 years, and despite brutal suppression, systematic oppression, uh, imprisonment, torture, and so on, in a relatively small country where the suffering of one person is felt by many because it's a relatively small country, you still have people defying this dictator, uh, voting against him in an election where he could, he very well could determine who voted against and who voted for him, and finally got rid of him. If you think of Africa today, if you think of um, in, in 1984, when um, President Buhari was a military dictator, when uh, that musician, Fela uh, Kuti, uh, challenged him, or he thought he was taunting him, just threw him in jail and uh, got away with it. Today, the same person is president of Nigeria. You just go online to see the kinds of things, you know, people are openly criticizing him, taunting him, and uh, he, he has to uh, go with it. And why, is he, why does he have to live with this? Because the Nigerian constitution uh, compels him to do so. The Nigerian courts will not tolerate this kind of, um, the kind of abuse that he used to heap on his people as a military dictator. That speaks to the power of institutions, and that as we invest in Africa, we should be thinking also of investing in the institutions that support accountable governance, mm -hmm. institutions that make presidents and power holders obey the law. So where they have term limits and um, presidents are trying to remove them, knowing that African populations support term limits, well, I think the solution or the prescription is that if you want to, uh, you want to be on the side of the people, then uh, support them to fight against them limits, uh, in addition to not just elections, but uh, I know OECD is very active on election support, but uh, many other things count, and they should be attended to and supported as well. Thank you. I think, uh, you know, sometimes we say we want more democratic implications, sometimes we're afraid of it. You know, populists, they like direct democracy because you can easily hijack it. So, but when it comes to the multilateral level, Elisa, do you, do you think we need more limitations of multilateral power or don't we actually need more democratic direct access? One of the issues that the EU is often accused of, that we have a democratic deficit. What, what is your take on that? Uh, okay, so I'll answer that, but I also want to tackle some of the questions that came from the audience, because uh, it's not an either or, mm. right? Um, international institutions um, and global governance comes in when there are those issues that are transboundary, right? So that, that's its value proposition, is what are those issues that require uh, global action, those issues where only together can we address issues. So pandemics, for instance, uh, we're trying to agree to uh, uh, non binding political framework around migration because there's a recognition that this isn't an issue that any one of us can deal with on our own, right? So that's where that's where global governance comes into play and you have to make sure that you're not being capricious about the moments when you decide that you need some kind of an international agreement or convention around it. Um, but there were a couple of other things that came up and I wanted to, to build, I 100% agree uh, with the importance of making sure that you're uh, reinforcing accountable institutions. And there's lots of ways you can do that at the macro level as you were suggesting, but also it's those micro investments that you make, including in things like supreme audit functions, for instance. Those are incredibly important, not sexy, uh, but incredibly important investments that you can make, just like training of judiciary, for instance, is incredibly important. Reinforcing forcing the competencies and capacities of parliamentarians around the world, uh, including on what are the right kinds of questions that you should be asking uh, as opposition, but also responding to questions when you are the leader in the House. I mean, these are all part of making sure that there is a greater sense of citizen confidence uh, in the way that the institutions are functioning. But there's a, a, a flip side to that as well, which is also civic engagement. What are the responsibilities of citizens to also engaging with their institutions. Um, and that's a reciprocal, there's a, there's a give and a take there. 
And governments do have a role to play, and I would say international institutions, well, regional institutions may also have a role to play as well in terms of letting citizens know what can they expect of their institutions. Do, do they even understand how bills are passed, how legislation functions? Um, you know, it's a, a Canadian proximity to the U.S. thing, um, so this might not mean a lot to uh, Europeans in the room, but there used to be this thing on... Um, Saturday mornings uh, on, the car on cartoons, right? We always watch cartoons on Saturday mornings as a kid. And there used to be this thing in the States called Schoolhouse Rocks. And I can guarantee you, I know more about how a bill is passed in the United States than any Canadian should, but all Canadian kids used to watch Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> and so we know how a bill comes into law because it came into our psyche, right? I the equivalent in the Canadian context is participation. Uh, we used to have this national campaign about healthy living, healthy eating. It started when we you were kids, you'd get little crests if you did a certain number of push-ups, all of these things, that's a form of civic engagement. We now need to be doing those kinds of activities when it comes to things like the Sustainable Development Goals, for instance, right? If we're serious about the SDGs, you make it so that people understand what it means to them in a very practical way. We talk about international humanitarian law, People need to understand what it means to them in a very practical way. Like you, I've spent time in Colombia. You can go out to the Cacarica, uh, the most remote of the villages, and you can sit down and you will have a conversation. They know the Inter-American Declaration of Human Rights and they can tell you exactly what their rights are. That's incredibly important if you're going to have a vibrant civil society and, and democratic experience. Maybe the last thing I, I would just say, because I, I know you didn't necessarily like our presentations and we won't take it personally. Um, but just to say, I think that um uh, Casper's ra raised a number of really important questions, and I, I had the opportunity to be in Silicon Valley uh, two weeks ago, and so you're living it. Um, but what struck me uh, was still this... Um, kind of unbound optimism uh, about pursuing, kind of breaking the boundaries on certain things. Um, and I think what it means, you talked a lot about regulation. I think part of the challenge then though, as policymakers, and, and in a sense we support policymakers, is that means though that we need to make sure, this speak, it's counterintuitive, it speaks to the importance of expertise, in fact, because there, I went to Singularity University, and they're looking at kind of, Drank the Kool -Aid. they're looking at some very uh, interesting, uh, potentially really positive contributions to mankind, yeah. but also potentially horrifying in terms of m modifying genes, for instance. So if you're looking at regulations, it means that policymakers actually need to understand all of that in order to know where the brakes need to be put on things. And so again, there's this kind of dynamic interface that has to happen between us in the policy advice community, the role of civil society and remaining engaged, and then the role of policy makers, people who claim that they want to effectively represent their citizens, and also being knowledgeable about how some of those things are evolving. Thank you, Kaspar. There, were, there was one precise question for you, but I would also throw the Facebook question at you, since you are the closest to the tech world. Should we uh, vote for the president of Facebook? Yeah, let's save that one for the break. <laughs> Um, no, but, but I think to, to the mm. two questions by the gentleman in ties, um, perhaps just a, a small anecdote. I met with one of the chief economists uh, of one of the very large uh, tech companies in, in Silicon Valley a few months ago, and we were talking about a very sexy issue, uh, taxation. Um, and you probably know this, but in, in Europe, on average, digital companies pay around half as much as traditional companies uh, are doing. That's an existential threat to the welfare system of, of Denmark or, or indeed the European uh, model. Um, so we had the European Commission coming forward with two proposals. Uh, the destiny was not fantastic for those two proposals for a variety of reasons. But I was talking to the chief economist and saying, Yo, what do you think about these uh, proposals? And he said, well, we really don't like them. So I said, so, so how do we work together on finding a way forward that um, sort of finds a compromise between the need of, of states or Europe to, uh, to tax and create revenues for schools and for healthcare and, and your sort of commercial interest. And he said, uh, that's not my problem, you solve that. And I think that's a pretty good indication of uh, the need to change the mindset in, in the C-suite of some of the big companies because the alternative to working together is in fact to bring the big stick out. And I think something that we're very honest about in this initiative is that uh, governments rarely gets it right um, to begin with. And I think when you look at the unprecedented speed and pace of new technologies, and again, I'm living in it on a daily basis, um, I think we have to be very honest in saying that it's extremely difficult for us to understand 
understand the new technologies mm. and therefore to get the policies or the regulatory framework right. But in the absence of an interaction, it takes two to tangle. Mm -hmm. And if the industry, industry doesn't want to work with us, the only alternative is for us to, to cook it off here in Brussels and perhaps we won't get it right. So I think this is actually a fantastic open uh, invitation to the companies to come in and work with us and, and to try and find a, a way forward that is, is mutual beneficial. Um, so I think that's, that's the point forward. I think self-regulation is incredibly important. I think what we're trying to do is to raise the stakes so that we say to the companies, if you do not tread the, the right way forward. We're going to hold you accountable. We'll, we'll sort of increase the public scrutiny by having an embassy or an ambassador to, to, to you rather than just the countries. I think that has a socializing effect on some of the companies, although we're not quite there yet. Um, I think there was a specific question on cybersecurity. Um, uh, again, if I go back to, to the NotPetya and WannaCry attacks last year, yeah. I think that's set in motion in Europe and elsewhere. Um, a lot of work on, on sort of the na national capabilities, and I think we've become much better at that, including in Denmark. I think where we're still um, struggling, uh, finding the, the silver bullet is on the international collaboration. Um, how do we get the normative dimension right? How do we make sure we keep the right people inside the room? and the less good people outside the room. And I think the problem with, with the cyber attacks is, of course, that this is a perfect storm between different actors. I think if you look at conventional warfare, you know, nobody would, would compare a robber with, with, a, with a soldier in a uniform. The problem is with the cyber attacks, you know, what is, what is the state-driven cyber attacks and what are the criminality and how do, how do those two things fit together? It makes it much more complicated and therefore we need increased international collaboration. That's something we're trying to, uh, to get at and, and trying to fix. Who is actually leading the discussion internationally on, on collaboration on cyber security? Any, any, um, any ideas? I would actually argue that's a private company, Microsoft. Um, they proposed a digital Geneva Convention. They've come up with a tech accord, and more than 60 companies have today signed up to it. I think that's fantastic. That's a kind of responsibility that we would like to see from the industry, although we don't support a digital Geneva Convention. But it is a quite interesting uh, indication of, of the contours of the new world order, that it's a private company that is, in fact, pushing uh, governments to, to consider whether we need a digital Geneva Convention or whether we can uh, stick with the current ones. And I think that shows why it is that we need more tech ambassadors and why, why it is that we need to consider, uh, from a foreign policy point of view, some of these companies in, in the light that we're doing. Very last point, and then I'll shut up, sorry. Um, I, think, I think what we be have to be careful about sitting here in Brussels is also um, there is a tech lash. Um, mm. It goes a little bit in the direction of the, uh, of the Facebook comment before. And again, you don't become a bigger fan of the tech companies when you have your daily interactions <laughs> with them. Let me be blunt about that. The degree <laughs> of arrogance and, uh, and refusing to take responsibilities is quite, uh, quite blunt. Um, but I think we have to be extremely careful in Europe that we don't look uh, towards the American companies only with negativity, <coughs> pessimism, uh, confrontation. Um, and similarly, I think in, in the US, uh, we have to be very careful that Silicon Valley or the broader epicenters of innovation, that don't look at Europe to, as this sort of uh, horrible beast that is bringing out the regulatory state, want to break them out. Because at the end of the day, we're still part of the same uh, history, we're still part of the same value systems. Uh, we actually need to stick together when we look uh, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, because the, the battles that are coming in our direction are much more serious than the ones that we're facing right now. Thank you. Annette, a question on regulation, legal regulation of transnational crime. Do you have practical solutions you could share? Well, I would first of all suggest that we also need to kind of rethink the level at which we're operating, right? Because the focus is here on the member states here. I would say, well, because these are flows and, and operations that are transnational at the local level and at the international level, we also have to do the same with our responses. So there are local levels in border areas specifically, where we have cross-border initiatives, where local authorities um, cooperate across the border and engage in humanitarian relief operations. But often we come in as outsiders without even being aware of those, of those local measures. So it's really the coordination and, and the, the collaboration across the local, regional, and the global, or the way we call it right now, is the global level, right? But I also wanted to just follow up quickly on the point about um, trust, and perhaps that also relates to um, Lisa's point about, well, who is aware of those regulations and norms. Um, well, first of all, we need to kind of make the distinction between the actual knowledge or the facts and perceptions. And often we tend to ignore the, f the, the perceptions. So what we consider 
as important as a legal framework or what we consider legitimate, often at the local level in conflict areas, is not necessarily the same. So if I'm a poor farmer and don't have any other opportunity than engaging um, in the cultivation of poppy or of coca, well, that for me is legitimate, even though it might be considered illegal by someone else. If we then start our interventions based on that, they can actually backfire because if the state comes in with strict law enforcement measures and takes away the livelihood opportunities of those people, it means that we fuel local grievances, which we see across the Middle East, which we see in Africa, which we see in, in Latin America, and have no longer the local communities who we could um, engage with. So it's about understanding how we can actually increase the trust of those communities towards the government and increase the, the perceived legitimacy rather than focusing on what is legal and, and what is illegal in that sense. Just Thank you. On sorry, your, sorry, to on the specific on yeah. question though about the responsibilities of states on IHL, I mean, all of us, every government that's signed up to the Geneva Conventions, it's written as plain as day, we have an obligation to do outreach and advocacy in support of IHL. And so there's a whole series of initiatives that actually are, are underway right now to try to revitalize that, um, including in our discussions with allies on the ground, right? If we're engaging with certain kinds of non-state actors, uh, we have to make sure that they also understand those obligations and parameters. So let me use the last five minutes. I have one minute for each of you to address the question, don't worry, they were warned beforehand. Which issue do you feel we are not paying enough attention to as policymakers? And what, you know, what, this is your one minute to, to draw our attention to that. Chima, maybe can I start with you? Still, uh, back to my hobby horse of um, Africans and democracy. Yes, consider that the African population, as we all know, it's highly youthful. The, the youth population is very large and is growing every day. Also, the population is increasingly getting urbanized and more and more are falling into the middle class category. These are the classes of Africans and the groups of Africans who are most demanding of accountability, of the democracy and so on. So those who think well, you know, this um, who fo basically largely following this, the, 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 the songs of African elites are saying that, well, you know, this democracy thing is not working for Africa. Um, we have to get back to the serious business of uh, growing economy and uh, stemming migration. So we are ignoring democracy and governance support. Well, my suggestion, my advice to Europe and to all of us is that we cannot, we don't have the luxury of not attending to the need for accountable governance for democracy in Africa anymore because the dynamics are shifting. Young people would want it, middle class people would want it, and especially urban and peri-urban peri dwellers are going to want it. And we want to be, to position ourselves in a, a, where they are because that's the future of Africa. Africa is a positive message, uh, and it, what is the one issue you would like to draw attention to today? Well, I would like to draw attention, coming from the security perspective, on the invisible, intangible security impacts um, that we see across the world and that will become bigger. We tend to focus on large-scale violence. We tend to focus on mass displacement and think that this is where we immediately need to respond. But actually, in those areas where people live under the rule of, for example, non-state actors, this is where grievances are being fueled. This is where we see kind of the recruitment of future um, rebel or other fighters, and this is where we are losing part of a global citizenry or citizenship, if you want, because these are the ones who are left behind. These are one, the ones who are not benefiting from technology or from other issues. So if we forget about those people who are living in those communities and often in conflict zones, that will backfire in the future. Okay, uh, Elisa. Yeah, I struggled with your only one. So <laughs> one and a half? <laughs> Can one and a half? Okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, for me, political solutions. Uh, we, we have a dearth of uh, international tools in our toolkit uh, to deal with the protracted crises that we have. Uh, we can go with statements, we have sanctions, we have use of force. There's a lot of space in between that um, and there's a need for us to identify more 
opportunities to bring solutions forward. And that speaks to some of the things that came up in the earlier panels. The fact that we have a protracted forced displacement, the fact that people on average now are displaced 17 to 25 years, that that is catastrophic. That should be something that everybody reflects hard on because it has all kinds of knock-on consequences, which kind of comes to my second thing I don't think we spend enough time on, which is diversity and inclusion um, and addressing uh, gender inequalities. Uh, if we tackle those questions, um, those are the gifts that keep on giving in terms of reinforcing societal bonds and strengthening, again, commitments to governance and democratic institutions. Thank you. Kaspar. Yeah, I'll probably repeat myself a little bit, but I think last year was uh, was an important year. It was the first year when uh, the overall amount of investments going into artificial intelligence um, more went to, to China than anywhere else. In fact, 48% of all venture capital went to China, 38% went to the US, and the, the remaining 40% went to the rest of the world. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, that includes Europe, uh, Africa, South America, and uh, many parts of, of Asia. I think we, we, we need a sense of urgency among policymakers and decision makers that uh, a major tectonic shift is on its way, uh, driven by technology and digitalization. Um, and I think the bottom uh, line, and, and this will come as a big surprise being a, a diplomat from a foreign ministry, I think we have to uh, do up with the misconception that the digital age requires less international collaboration. I think it requires much more international collaboration. And I think in times of political turmoil, um, getting that right, uh, both domestically and internationally, is more important than ever before. So for you and for the people in the audience who feel slightly pessimistic about the oh, world in general, uh, <laughs> uh, we have a special, a special next uh, uh, slot for you. Uh, Anna rosling Rönlund will challenge your mind. She's the, Gap, um, the vice president of Gapminder, and she will inject a dose of optimism. I hope you participated in the poll beforehand. Uh, before we move over to her presentation, though, please join me in an applause for my four excellent speakers. <laughs> 